everybody. Welcome to this Civic Saturday. My name is Erin Kelly, and I am the program director for Spirit and Place. Uh, for anyone who is unfamiliar with Spirit and Place, we are a legacy project of the Polis Center, and we are housed in the School of Liberal Arts at IUPUI. As an organization, we believe in the power of the arts, humanities, and religion to bring people together and to build community. So I want to begin today by thanking our Civic Saturday host, Central Library. Um, they've been working with us since last year, and we greatly appreciate having a space to do these. I also want to thank our um, coffee partner, the League of Women Voters of Indianapolis. They supplied the wonderful coffee over there. And then we are, um, during the day, we're going to be led in song by Song Squad, and I'd like to acknowledge their continued support in showing up to these events and helping to enliven this group and build community through song and through music. And you'll also notice that today we are being filmed by KI New Media. Um, this is, or I'm sorry, yeah, KI New Media is the media video production wing of the Kepra Institute. Um, and we've got a table back there that's being stationed by the IU Center on Representative Government. So these are all amazing community assets. These are all wonderful organizations that do the work of helping to bring us together. So if you're unfamiliar with any of these groups, there are representatives from them throughout the room, talk to them. Learn a little bit more about some of these amazing organizations and the work that they're doing in this community. And lastly, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for choosing to spend this time together today, choosing to spend time in fellowship. It's no small choice that you have made to enter a space filled with strangers and to let go of the me to become the we, to become us. And it's that idea of becoming us that we're going to explore today. And as with all Civic Saturdays, we're going to explore this idea with poetry, song, readings, group conversations called Civic Circles at the end, and a Civic Sermon. And the goal of these gatherings is always to create a space where we get to wrestle with the American creed, but also celebrate what our shared little d democratic values are. Now to begin all this, I'd actually like for us to center ourselves. So that means if you have your cell phone out and you're inclined to text and whatnot, put it away. Just, just put it away, let it go. Um, give yourself that gift of just kind of being together for the next hour. And I also am gonna ask you, just take a moment, close your eyes. Plant your feet firmly on the ground. Hold your hands in a way that's comfortable to you. And then just breathe. Breathe in the rhythm that makes you feel most comfortable. And so for the next hour or so, really, give yourself the gift of being in uninterrupted fellowship with each other. All of those errands and tasks that you have waiting for you at the end of the day, they're going to be there in an hour. But for the next 60 minutes, <laughs> let it go. So go ahead and open your eyes. Shake anything out that you need to. Everybody feeling okay? All right, great. Well, I am happy to announce we're going to start today's um, Civic Saturday with a song led by Song Squad. And Pam, I'm going to ask you and your crew to come on up. Thank you, Erin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so in addition to um, being privileged to serve as director of Spirit in Place, I'm also the co-leader of Song Squad Indianapolis, which I lead with my brother, Adam. And uh, uh, our, our specialty is um, paperless singing in a perfection-free zone. Uh, but just a lot of gratitude for Erin Kelly and the amazing work that she does for Spirit of Place and the rest of our staff and steering committee um, and for all the people that I get to work with to use the arts, humanities, and religion to uh, work together and bring communities together. So um, to express that gratitude, we're going to teach you a gratitude song this morning. And the words are uh, from G.K. Chesterton. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Can you say that? Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. And it's got two parts. I'm going to teach you both. And just so that you know, we're modeling the what, uh, what we do. There's only about three people behind me that know this song. So we're teaching it to everybody today. All right? We're teaching it to everybody today. And here's how it goes. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Give thanks. Give thanks. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Give thanks. Give thanks. Again. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Give thanks. Oh, yeah. Give thanks. A little more. And. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Give thanks. Give thanks. And the next part goes. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa, give thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you. Whoa, give thanks. Okay, yeah, and you can like, like, whoa. <laughs> like I got some gratitude today. Whoa, give thanks. Try it again. Go. Thank you. Thank you. And whoa, give thanks. I like that. Do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa, give thanks. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. You all are going to sing the first part. You all are going to sing that part we just did, okay? And if you get lost, follow Adam because he knows the bottom part. And we're, we're going to make it up. You might harmonize if you're so inclined. We love that, right? Just add whatever you want. You want to take a little riffity solo on the top? Yeah, coffee, coffee, coffee. So whatever, whatever you're grateful for today. Whatever you're grateful for today. Really, like, think about it. Take just a second here. What, are you, what gratitude are you carrying into the room today? Yeah? What gratitude are you bringing in? So here we go with the first part. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Give thanks. Give thanks. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Give thanks. Keep it going. Give thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa. Dog eat dog, 
of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man, full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient, endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today, despite the dream, beaten yet today. Oh, pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet, I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, uh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee and torn from black Africa's strain, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay? For all the dreams we dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me by any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America! Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet, I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft, the stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Thank you. Hello, I am Susan Davis with the Indianapolis Public Library. For the next few minutes, we're going to give you time to connect with each other. This is an opportunity to build community before we reflect on the reading. Turn to our neighbor, probably somebody you don't know, and talk about unexpected connections. That is, the time you were pleasantly surprised to find yourself connecting with someone you didn't think you had anything to share with them or anything in common with. Uh, we're going to give you about five to six minutes to do this. Thanks. Hi. Hi. My name is Peggy Campbell. Um, 
Good morning. I'm happy to be, this is my first time here, so this is, this is really great. Um, I'm reading an excerpt from the book Democracy, a Case Study by David A. Moss. American democracy has always been a relentless struggle, both to expand its promise and to protect itself against forces of decay and corruption. It is a remarkable process, to say the least, but not an automatic one. It requires constant vigilance. This struggle, at its best, implies productive tension in the nation's politics, tension in the form of competing ideas, interests, and institutions made productive, ultimately by a deep faith in and a shared commitment to the nation's system of democratic self-governance. This is what gives life to American democracy and has sustained it through countless trials. Hi, my name is Ken Honeywell. I'm reading an excerpt from the essay Self-Reliance by Ralph Waldo Emerson. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you said today. Ah, so you shall be sure to be misunderstood. Is it so bad then to be misunderstood? To be great is to be misunderstood. Hi, I'm uh, Jenny Skihan, and I am reading the Oath of Allegiance given to new citizens as part of their naturalization ceremony. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. Can we thank our guest readers, please? They showed up today having no idea they'd be asked to read, you know, literature from 1841, so. So I really appreciate them being willing to do that. Uh, welcome again, everybody, and thank you again, Peggy, um, Ken, and Jenny. I really do appreciate you doing that for us. Now, civic readings, as um, outlined in the program, are an opportunity for us to reflect on the American creed and, and what it means, and to reflect on, on, on you know, what it means to be an American. And in, in our promotions today for the Civic Saturday, we encouraged you to invite a friend, um, particularly a friend or a family member who you might find challenging at times to have conversations <laughs> with. So if you invited someone with you, thank you. And if you are that invitee, thank you for coming because I'm sure you had no idea what you might be getting into. Uh, but regardless, whether you invited someone to be with you here today or not, um, I hope that you will reach out to someone who you find challenging sometimes to have conversations with and reflect on today's theme, which is becoming us. More specifically, the idea of becoming us through acknowledging and wrestling with our shared civic values. The toxicity in our culture right now has divided many of us to the point, myself included on bad days, where we've not only lost sight, but have lost the ability to even focus on what is supposed to unite us. And that is those deep civic values that allow us to be us, to be Americans. The former governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick said, we are not united around a common religion or even a common language, but around a handful of civic values. At the end of the day, that's what makes us a unique experiment in human history. Now, I believe our civic values can and should unite us. 
But to do so, it's important we talk not only about the values themselves, but how they oftentimes conflict and compete with one another. So case in point, can we all here agree, um, in theory, if not always in practice, that the items I'm about ready to list are quintessential American civic values? Liberty, civic value. Self-government, democracy. Individual rights and civil, civil liberties. Equality, all right. You've seen a lot of heads nodding. Yes, we agree these are civic values. Now by a show of hands, how many of you in this room value those values? You think liberty, equality, democracy, these are, these are good ideas. Great, okay, it's unanimous. I was hoping for that. <laughs> That's cool. Um, it looks like we share the same civic values. Yay us. But what if I were to ask you to rank those values? What if I were to ask you to dis discuss which is most important to you and why? What if I were to pair up a couple of those values and have you pick the one you think is most important for America to live up to? Now, if we started having those conversations, what do you think would happen? We, we disagree. I mean, you know, we disagree about it. Um, because we, although we value those values, we value or prioritize them differently. And again, we would disagree if we started to unpack that. Because this whole civic values thing, this stuff that makes us us, it is really tricky. These values are complex, and they exist in a state of tension with each other, and therefore they exist within a state of tension between us. So this idea of us and becoming us, it's not meant to be easy. Um, and more to the point, that's not actually how healthy democracies function. A healthy democracy is not one where everyone gets along and agrees. A healthy democracy is not devoid of conflict. A healthy democracy is not civil for the mere sake of civility. Healthy democracies hold tension between competing ideas and values. Healthy democracies use conflict to grow, to test themselves, and to strive to be more. Healthy democracies need disagreement, and our democracy historically has grown and evolved after periods of conflict. Now the trick, of course, is for this conflict to be productive and not destructive. The trick at the end of all of this disagreeing is to maintain not only our own humanity, but to see the humanity in others. And this takes hard work, it takes patience, and it takes a willingness to deeply engage others and to listen to where they are coming from. And I think rooting these conversations in the history of our civic values how these values emerged, where the tension comes from, how it's played out over time, and how we prioritize our values differently is a useful tool and a useful starting place for hard conversations. Now, spoiler alert though, even if you approach things from this civic value-based perspective, um, rather than immediately diving into a policy debate with someone, you are still going to disagree with that crotchety uncle of yours at Thanksgiving, or that <laughs> hipster niece who has just come back from her first semester of college. And that's okay, because agreement isn't always the goal. Being able to see each other's humanity at the end of that disagreement, that needs to be our goal right now. Now I wanna be clear though, if the other person that you are engaging absolutely refuses to see your humanity, refuses to let go of their own hate, you move your energy somewhere else. Disengage from that particular outrage loop, okay? Doing so is not only a measure of self-care, it is, I think, a measure of civic care. Because unfortunately, there are people who are more interested in destroying and annihilating the other side from both ends of the political spectrum than in actually working together. Don't let them exhaust you. Don't lend them a hand in tearing apart our civic fabric. You do your work where it will make the most positive impact where it will help us see each other as us. But don't be scared from doing this work, because right now in this civic climate, we need it. We need people willing to do the work of seeing us as us and not us and them. And people who are willing to talk about why this is important. That's the only way the actual problems in this nation can be solved. So maybe keep in mind the words of James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So let's face some of those tensions. Now I think the biggest, if not the biggest, um, conflicting set of values in America is our democracy 
and liberty. And some of you might be thinking, what do you mean democracy and liberty in conflict with each other? I mean, they should go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? <laughs> Here's an important fact about peanut butter and jelly, y'all. Most of the world thinks that's a disgusting combination and they won't try it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about democracy and liberty and then I wanna drill down a little bit deeper and we're going to talk about how the values of individualism and the common good need to be held in balance. How we need to move away from either or propositions concerning civic values like individualism and the common good and focus on the and. And lastly, I want to unpack the tension that exists between the very idea of rights and responsibilities. Because when we have different, different ideas about democracy and liberty and individualism and the common good, we are going to have different outlooks on what our rights and responsibilities are. And my hope is you're going to leave here today with a few ideas on how you might engage those you disagree with, um, how you might even frame different, maybe even smarter arguments. Um, but again, the, the goal isn't to stop disagreeing. It's just to be productive in those disagreements. Um, because you know, when it comes to policy, we should disagree with one another. We should hold our values firm and have those disagreements. But again, we want to see each other's humanity at the end of it all. And maybe if we do this, we can begin to mend our civic fabric. That is, if we take a step back, examine and clarify our own civic values, find what's true in our own hearts, risk being misunderstood, and then openly ask others what they value and why. That is to otherwise do the work of rediscovering what makes us, us. So let's start by talking about liberty and democracy. Broadly speaking, democracy is rule by the people and liberty is the ability to do as you please. <laughs> liberty is, it's about the ability of the individual to pursue whatever with as little government interference as possible. But democracies are based on the concept, if not always the execution, of equality. So to ensure that the same equal rights are shared by everyone in a democracy, laws are created. And democracies therefore operate on the rule of law, and in our case that rule of law is established by majorities. And I think we do need the rule of law because if every individual were to pursue their own liberty at all cost, there would be chaos. Now on the other hand, democracies absolutely do need to be kept in check and limited in some way, or they will trample liberty. So liberty and democracy, while compatible, they do exist in a permanent state of conflict and tension. And they need both the <coughs> vigilance and the faith of you and me in order to work together. Now this tension played out in the earliest days of America's founding. Uh, so much so that in 1786, a year before the Constitution was adopted, George Washington lamented in a letter I am really mortified beyond expression that in our moment of acknowledged independence, we should, by our conduct, verify the predictions of our transatlantic foe and render ourselves ridiculous and contemptible in the eyes of all of Europe. I loved it when I found that quote. It sounds like something a 14-year-old might write in their journal. <laughs> and I know we put our founding fathers on our money and on our monuments, um, but I'm here to tell you, these boys fought, they fought ugly, and they fought in public. Um, I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, and we are fond of saying democracy is um, not a spectator sport. Man, these guys treated it like a contact sport. Democracy has never been dainty, okay? Now, one of the key struggles they faced was how to create an entirely new system of government that empowered the majority enough to get things done while simultaneously limiting that majority so minority rights would not be squashed. In other words, they're asking themselves, how do we build a government? How do we build a society where both democracy and liberty can thrive? Now here is where I do want to take a step back and I want to acknowledge that the democratic system they were creating was not truly being created for all. The majorities and the minorities as defined by our founders was incredibly limited and it was skewed by their own privilege and backgrounds. We know majoritarian abuses occurred, the horror of slavery being just one of them. And it's in this environment where America had just defeated the world's strongest monarchy and was understandably nervous about creating too strong of a central government and an environment where the hypocrisy of liberty and slavery coexisted that James Madison, a slave owner himself, um, during the Constitutional Convention in 1787 proposed something called the federal negative. Is anyone wonky enough to know what the federal negative is? It's okay, it's pretty wonky. <laughs> Um, so basically, the federal negative um, is the idea that Congress should have veto power over any state law. 
Now, Madison and others thought that the tyranny of the majority was more powerful at this, more likely to happen at the state level, wherever democracy was smallest, and that Congress should be able to correct the states when they got out of line. Now, one of the people who disagreed with this approach was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is always going to be your states' rights kind of guy. He thought the court should handle any constitutional disputes concerning state laws. Now, there was a lot of back and forth of this, a lot of versions of the federal negative being proposed, a lot of open disputes about the federal negative, um, and ultimately it was not included in the Constitution, and the matter was resolved really in 1803 with the case of Marbury versus Madison. Think back to those old civics classes you took in high school. Uh, Marbury versus Madison was when the Supreme Court asserted its power of judicial review over both federal and state legislative acts. Jefferson wins at the end of the day. That's what you need to know. Now, this is just one example of many of how competing values and democratic uh, philosophies shaped the debate and structure of America. And if you want to dig deeper into those and get really wonky, there's the book um, Democracy, a Case Study from David Moss. That's the first uh, civic reading we shared today. It goes through a lot of examples like these. It's a, it's a wonderful resource. But the point I'm trying to make is that these competing values and debates and arguments and slightly whiny letters to friends and public feuds and eventual litigation, it led to a better system. Not a perfect one, not by a long shot, but a better system. Working through conflicts and tensions inherent in our democratic values has the potential to make us stronger. With the exception of the Civil War when our democracy broke and shattered into a million pieces, the conflicts that have arisen in this nation have historically catalyzed us to dig deeper. They've um, catalyzed us to get more engaged, to act when needed, and to cooperate with one another in the interest of the common good. So I want to talk about those values now for a bit, this idea of the common good and individualism. From Abraham Lincoln's ability to work his way up from extreme poverty to become President of the United States, to Madam C.J. Walker becoming the first African-American millionaire in America, we have some fantastic stories of individual success in this country. But those bootstrap kind of stories don't tell the full story. They feel good. They feel really good. But they don't capture, they fail to capture the advantages that some groups have had and continue to have over others. Yet many of us, especially Hoosiers, including this one up here, are really proud of the individual streak that runs through our shared heritage. In a world where we can point to any number of persecuted and oppressed groups, I am filled with gratitude to live in a land where women, people of color, immigrant, gay, and trans communities have been able to fight for their individual rights. Those are my values, and I'm not going to shy away from them. Now, granted, I am angry these groups have had to fight in the first place and that many are still <coughs> fighting. Um, like Washington, I am mortified by our General Assembly and its inability to pass a meaningful hate crimes bill. Um, but I won't hide the fact that I am glad we get a chance to fight, because there are many places in the world where that simply is not true. And I am in awe that we live in a nation that produced the likes of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who in his 1841 essay, Self-Reliance, admonishes us to be nonconformist, who warns a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, and later in the essay tells us to trust thyself. Emerson tells us to believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you and your private heart is true for all, that's genius. That's how you live a life of principle. And there is something very validating about that. It's an exhilarating acknowledgement that my truth matters, that your truth matters, that liberty and individualism are great things. But in a, therein lies the rub in a democracy, because where does the common good fit in if we're also focused on being individuals? As a nation and a people, we are guided by a constitution that begins with the words, we the people, not I the citizen, and that references things like a common defense and the general welfare. Our beautiful constitution's preamble oozes with commonness, and no one likes to be common. To be common is to be boring. It's been done before. And in a society that promotes and celebrates individuality, common isn't much of a compliment. Common sure isn't amazing. Nor is it. In 2009, a little-known economic program headquartered um, at, on IU Bloomington's campus called the Workshop on Political Theory made national headlines. That morning, the founder of the workshop, Eleanor Ostrom, woke to learn that she had just been awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. Still the first and only woman to win that award, by the way. 
Now, my very simplistic understanding of Ostrom's work, and it is a simplistic understanding of Nobel Prize winning economic work, is this. <laughs> when it comes to managing commonly held resources, individuals will organize into some form of collective self-government. And most importantly, that system that they create works. That is, when faced with the need to manage and share precious resources, individuals will create a system that requires them, requires us, to work together. We will find common ground. We will reach common agreement. We will acknowledge that our individual selves are best served when we work towards a common good, when we act and become us. We can be proud, non-conforming individuals and successfully work towards the common good. Individualism alone, a pursuit of liberty and self-interest alone, will not better society. But neither will exclusive focus on the common good, because the individual soul, it needs a little liberty so that its truth can be recognized and honored. And then we individuals, we need each other to get stuff done. Now, I believe in the power of the individual and the beauty of our own agency, but I also believe that we are strongest when we work together. And again, none of this is an either or proposition. It's about the and. It's about that big, beautiful, juicy, gr glorious space of the and and what can happen there. And the and is certainly at play when we talk about rights and responsibilities. Everybody knows that phrase, right? Rights and responsibilities just rolls off the tongue, right? Rights and responsibilities. Um, but really, except maybe for a high school civics test we took however many years ago, how many of us have spent much time unpacking this idea of rights and responsibilities? Probably not many. Now, one group of people who have spent time uh, wrestling with this are those who are preparing to become citizens because it's part of the U.S. naturalization test. And if you go to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services website, you will see study materials and you will see a list of rights and responsibilities. So can you right here, who can name me a few rights that we have as Americans that you think are outlined in, that, in the naturalization test? Just yell them out. Voting. Voting. <coughs> Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Civil rights. Civil rights. Freedom of religion. Bear arms, yeah. I'm sorry? Right to assemble. Right to assemble. <laughs> All right. Yes, no, your Bill of Rights. Awesome. Travel among the states. Travel, yeah. So outlined on the website is um, freedom to express yourself, freedom to worship as you wish or not, the right to a prompt, fair trial by jury, the right to vote, the right to run for office, and the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the freedom from cruel and unusual punishment. Freedom from cruel and unusual punishment. Now, we talk about responsibilities a little less. Um, we read the Oath of Allegiance earlier, so you have some idea of what um, new citizens are studying. But what are some other responsibilities you think might be outlined? Um, and what are some other responsibilities we have as Americans? Taxation. Taxation. To vote. To vote. To follow the law. Follow the law. It's a little harder, right? We don't spend that much time really talking and unpacking our responsibilities. Um, so outlined on this website, I'll read, read to you. Um, support and defend the Constitution. Stay informed on issues affecting your community. Participate in the democratic process. Respect and obey federal, state, and local laws. Respect the rights, beliefs, and opinions of others. Participate in your local community. Pay income taxes. Fairly and on time, uh, defend the country should the need arise. Now, we love our rights, and well, we should. They are some of the most beautiful and bold in the world. Um, but we don't talk about those responsibilities much, and we really don't talk about how our experiences receiving or being denied certain rights shapes our sense of responsibility. Historically and still today, not everyone has had, equal, has had access to the full range of rights in America. And as Langston Hughes tells us, America was never America to me. Now, Hughes was a black man who wrote that poem during the Great Depression. It's a piece spoken from his perspective as a black American, but he also took on the perspective of poor whites and Native Americans and new immigrants, all of those who America has failed over time. Now, I think the stories of Washington and Madison and Jefferson, things like that story of the federal ne negative that I mentioned earlier, that's a part of our history. We need to know that. We need to understand that. But we also need to know the history that Hughes is talking about. 
and, and not exclude these two pieces of history, right? The and, we need to know them all. And we have to embrace it all in order to understand why not, why not everyone sees the concept of rights and responsibilities the same way. One sense of responsibility to a nation that has historically denied them rights is going to look very differently to someone who has not experienced that kind of inequality. So you might, for example, feel it's your responsibility to protest during a football game by taking a knee during the national anthem because your life experiences have taught you there's no other way to be seen or heard. Or, I'm going to flip this, if promised by politicians that an industry would always be in your community and then it not only leaves your community but leaves your country and those politicians who told you they would always have your back are receiving donations from the very industries that took those jobs away from you, you might feel it's your job to vote for an outsider. The reality is the rights we value and the responsibilities we hold dear are influenced by a myriad of factors, a myriad of competing interests and civic values. And these values are why some people focus on rights related to the individual and others to an entire group. And these are the kinds of civic tensions and history we need to acknowledge in trying to understand those we disagree with. Because again, this isn't about agreeing. It's about understanding that given your neighbor's background and history, they might be experiencing a very different America than you are. And keeping all of this in mind, it's not going to solve our civic woes. And it doesn't mean I expect you to run out there and befriend a MAGA hat wearing stranger or an AOC superfan. But it does mean it's worth the effort to dig a little deeper and to try to see the humanity in others if for no other reason than an us and them mentality is not only destructive to our civic fabric, it is destructive to our civic souls. Now living with all, the, all of this civic tension and finding balance, it is complicated to say the least. But despite the difficulty, it is absolutely possible to believe that liberty and democracy can go together like peanut butter and jelly, because peanut butter and jelly is awesome, right? It just requires a little faith and a little trust that it's going to work. And it requires us to wrestle with and gain um, clarity around our own civic values and what it means to hold in tandem the traditional belief of American individualism and the common good. And although they dance a tangled dance, we need to strive for understanding, if not agreement, on how and why civic values, rights, and responsibilities look and feel different across the table. So my encouragement to you is to go out into the world as a good citizen, someone who shows up for others in public life, and to not reflexively pick a side and firmly stick with it. Don't let consistency be the hobgoblin of your mind. Rather, endeavor to live in that space in between. Embrace the and so that you can do the work of becoming us and help fulfill America's promise, not only for yourself, but for the person sitting next to you. Now this democracy stuff, it is hard work, um, but you are here today, so I think that means you're up to it. And I thank you again for, for coming here and, and wrestling with these kinds of things. Now we always close our Civic Saturdays with a Civic Circle and a final song. In today's Civic Saturday, I want to do a little bit differently. I'm hoping that you'll get in groups of five, six, or seven people and these chairs are light, you can move them around. And what I want you to do is there's a little blue card that was put on your chair when you arrived. And you'll see on that card are the words liberty and equality. Now we all agreed at the beginning of this little talk here that liberty and equality were civic values we all hold in common. We all share that. But I want you to think, I'm not asking you to pick one or the other. But I want you to think about where in that spectrum of liberty, that idea that I've got the, I should be able to do what I need to do with as little government interference as possible, to the idea of equality, which is a state of being equal, especially in rights, status, and opportunities. Where in that spectrum do you fall in terms of your own civic values? There is no right or wrong answer to this. We just agree, they're all civic values. They're all American values. There's no right or wrong, but where do you fall in that spectrum? Why do you fall there? And that's what I'd like for you to talk about with each other. And I'd like you to listen deeply to those in your group. Listen to their values. Listen to where they're coming from. And I challenge you to not only honor the differences in opinions you might hear, but if something that is said that makes you think, I never thought of it that way, own that. Acknowledge that. Talk about that. We want to give you, what time is it? I'm going to give you about um, you know, seven, eight minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Just kind of get in some circles and talk a little bit about these values. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Concludes Civic Saturdays with a song, but before I do that, I do need to make a couple of announcements. First, um, we have two more Civic Saturdays planned for this year. One of them is actually going to be a Civic Saturday on a Tuesday, uh, because Saturday mornings don't work for everyone, and we wanted to do that. So there are flyers on the table. You're welcome to grab some flyers on your way out. Please share those with others. Um, I also want to say that Spirit and Place, the organization I work for, we are currently accepting um, applications for this year's Spirit and Place Festival. Our theme is Revolution. So if you have an event idea that you think would be great in the Spirit and Place Festival, please come and talk to me. I am the program director. It is my job to get you to apply. So, uh, you know, talk with me about all of that. I also have a couple of things. If anyone would like to sign up for the um, Peace and Justice, um, I'm sorry? Peace Justice Feature, which is a, a weekly email that comes out about um, events dealing with peace and justice and democracy. Jimbo back there can help you out. Wave. And then, finally, I am extremely happy to announce that Citizen University, the Seattle-based organization that pioneered Civic Saturdays and that um, selected me to go out there for training, they are continuing on with Civic Saturdays by selecting others from across the country to go to C Seattle and to, and to study and create these events. And is Abby still here? Yeah. There's Abby. This is Abby Dennis. Abby just got back from Seattle, and she is going to be starting her own Civic Saturday event. Um, now, these are not going to be under Spirit and Place's umbrella, but they are still, you know, this idea of creating a time of fellowship around our civic values. So if you'd like to connect with Abby afterwards, please, please do. I'm sure she would be happy to gather up anyone's contact information if you'd like to learn when she will be hosting her event. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. And we are going to conclude today with the singing of uh, This Land is Your Land. Because we're running a little late, we're going to cut it down a little bit. We're going to sing the first two verses, the last two verses, and then we're going to repeat the first. So first two, last two, repeat the first. And um, I do encourage you to go home and read through all of those verses later. We included some verses that don't always get included um, in this song. And that kind of, I think, like today, challenge you a little bit more to think about America and who it's for and, and, um, and its history. So we're going to go ahead. So if you would rise as willing or able, and we'll claim this land as your land. The first two verses, last two. And re um, I'm Kathy Ridley Merriweather, and um, this is my dad. What's your name? Thomas Ridley is my name. <laughs> and we are, this is our first time at Civic Saturday. So we're just going to tell you just a little bit about the impressions that we got. Uh, I will start. Um, this is my first one. It was really wonderful. I didn't really know what to expect. I enjoyed, because I find myself personally ignorant about all things civic, political, historical, things like that, I'm always excited about the opportunity to learn about them. And I really enjoyed the merging of uh, just kind of learning some and enjoying some and meeting new people. I think it's for everyone. I think this is a great opportunity for everyone. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. It was a, an organized thing to the things that uh, came out, some of the things that I knew but I had forgotten about. The more, you know, it just vague, you know, came, uh, came to me again. And I thought about other things that I experienced in my lifestyle. A lifetime, and uh, it was. Uh, I've been around quite a while. Uh, I'm 96 years old, so I get, I have gone through some experiences that came out today in the talks and whatnot. And I believe in most that, that all of that. It's all part of uh, the American way, and I definitely liked it. I think it'd be nice to come back again to the next one and uh, mm -hmm. try to learn some more. I think uh, one of the great things that we both enjoyed was the opportunity to talk to, just to talk to people that you wouldn't run into that's right. n necessarily. And it's, 
that's something that you really have to practice doing. You need to. I think we need to put ourselves in situations where we are gather, gathering yeah. together to talk to each other, mm -hmm. because otherwise we stay in our same circles and our same groups and we don't branch out. So Civic Saturday does the work of putting you, giving you the opportunity to talk to others, and then you just have to take one small step to go ahead and do it. Yeah. I, I enjoyed that part too. That's definitely it. You know, getting together to share ideas and uh, what it's all about. And some people said later, uh, at the end, uh, well, I never thought about the difference between the two, you know, the equality, equality and, 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 and liberty, and which liberty, was our topic liberty. today. Yeah, and uh, there is a up and down situation, you know, it's uh, how far are you into that? And that's the part, is to get, get that into your mind and yep. try to work it out. Or do I, am I... What am I willing to give up for one yeah. in order to, yeah. to have the I other? Yeah, with this, you know. But I, I hope to get back again to... Uh, Everybody should yeah, come. Yeah. should try it. It's only like an hour, so... I think I'll ask certain people, certain friends of mine to, to come to the next room with me. I, I came really this morning because my daughter was uh, going to be talking, and I just wanted to, I said, I've never been to that. I'll just go down here then. So I, I did come. Uh, I think I'll, I guess, the next time to bring someone with me. Hi, my name is Kathleen Angelum. I really enjoyed this event, and just like anything Aaron plans, it, it moved along beautifully. Um, what I really took away is a refreshing of my strong belief that America is based on hopes and dreams and that we're continually working towards those hopes and dreams. And I hope that these events spread and more people get together and talk and we are able to concentrate on the real values of America and not everyday divisions. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ruth. I like the way the event was modeled on um, a church uh, agenda, but it allowed us to think more about our responsibilities as being a citizen and what those responsibilities are to be engaged with others who may disagree with us. Yeah. So I found the discussion in small groups interesting and I would have liked to have had maybe more of that. I'm looking forward to the next one because it's on an evening and I think we may have a different group mix of people. My name is Abby Dennis. This is my uh, first attendance for Civic Saturday with Erin Kelly. I really enjoyed her passion for the subject matter and the ability to connect with like-minded people in Indianapolis that I didn't know before today. Uh, my biggest takeaway is that I've got a lot to work through on my own definitions of liberty and equality because it's something we all orient our lives around but don't always define um, and understand why we think the way we think. So. I'm also looking forward to leading a couple Civic Saturdays after receiving some training in Seattle with Citizens University. So the details for those activities are coming up soon and I'll be glad to share them. Gladly invite uh, everyone to come.